Great, thank you very much, uh, Armin, and, and, and I appreciate the um, the invite. By the way, it's always a pleasure to speak to people uh, who are, are going to, you know, a be interested in the subject matter, and also it's it's a great experience for me because one thing I always say when I, when I do speak to officials is everybody in this room, or at least this virtual room that we're in, you you're all better officials than me. Um, Armin asked me a question before we started in earnest here and, and he said are you a referee i'll come on a little bit more about that in a moment my i am a referee my, my level is seven i've been refereeing officially since october so not a long time at all and I've, you know obviously i've built up some experience here but essentially you know you guys in the field have much more expertise and experience than me so i'm not here to talk to you about how to be a better official in a practical sense what i'm here to talk to you about is an area that I absolutely love and have a, a real passion and enthusiasm for, and that's psychology. And you can see from my slide here, I love psychology. The reason I love psychology is because I can trace back to the moment that I thought, wow, this area is particularly interesting for me. And I was about 14 years old, and I was reading a newspaper article about a golfer, and I'm not a big golfer, and I couldn't even tell you the golfer's name. But this particular golfer was in the final of quite a prestigious tournament, and he just needed to putt uh, on the final hole to win the tournament. And the putt was two foot and the green was flat. And everyone was just expecting this guy to do it. And he missed. And that was okay because he could just sort of make up, get a bogey, and then take it over to like the, the, the 19th hole, if you like, and, and, and pay, a, pay a shootout. And he missed again, uh, losing him the title that he never won. And everyone was kind of flabbergasted and thought, well, how's this guy missed? When it's A, it's only two foot, and someone like myself who doesn't play golf could have, you know, could have sunk that. And B, how come someone with such high level of expertise has done it? What was it about that situation? And psychologists has called that the clutch effect. In layman's terms, it's just something must have happened that blocked off that route between the cognitive and the, um, and, and the physical. So I just saw a message in the chat there. Uh, Greg Norman, was it Greg? I'm in ten, yeah. Uh, Greg Norman, everyone. If I see things come up in the chat, by the way, as you can see, I'll, I'll keep it up there. Please feel free to type in questions, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them as we go. That's probably a nice way of doing it. Um, and I'm sort of, you know, that's where my interest grew. Over time, I've learned that it's not just uh, you know psychologists that adore this area. It's actually coaches as well, quite elite level coaches. And one of the elite level coaches in world sport that has particularly found psychology interesting is, is Clive Woodward. And going back to the golfing example, we can look at these, uh, these, these situations where high level performers don't perform to their maximum potential, which of course is the aim of any coach or the performer themselves. Clive Woodward sort of recognized this. And on this first meeting that he had, he cites in his book, Winning, with the England rugby team, he stated that this team, in terms of skill and in terms of ability, they had all of that in spades and they were equal to anyone else on the world stage. But what they might not have had was the correct psychological output. So essentially, did they lack the psychological skills? And was that because they lacked the psychological skills training within the RFU to maximize that? To Try to illustrate this to the players. He gave them a really short, small exercise that I want to share with you now. All I ask is if you have seen it before, uh, don't give it away too early on the chat. So I'm going to ask you guys to, when I get my cursor up here, there we go. I'm going to ask you guys to count the Fs. So all I'm, all I'm going to say there is count the letter Fs. I'm going to show a very short statement. I think it's like two lines long, maybe three lines long. Just count how many times you see the letter F. Okay, simple. I'll give you about 10 seconds to read it and then I'll take it back. Okay. Can I ask you in the chat just to type down how many Fs you got? So I've got a three, a two, a five, a six, a five, a five, a three. 
Wonderful. Okay. So let me ask, uh, Shell, you said three. Would you mind unmuting and just tell me how you feel seeing other people write five and someone else wrote six? Nervous. Okay. What what are you instantly thinking? Are you thinking you've made a mistake and got something wrong? Um, no, because it's other people's perception, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. if yeah, obviously there is a correct answer, but mm -hmm. it's the way you obviously see things, and that's my perception, and I counted three personally. So if I'm wrong, yes. I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm a referee. Yeah. Things wrong. <laughs> absolutely, we're all human. You're absolutely right. I'm gonna bring it up again this time. For those, and I know that some people that have got five, and, and I think it was Sean that got six, they're going, might know the answer. People that are five that are interested in, um, they might go, why did I miss that one? Because there are six there. So Armin and Shell, I just know that you guys got two and three respectively. Just have another look, and this time I want you to look at the word of. All oh, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you see where those go. now. The thing is, I think sometimes people look at that and they go, oh, you know, I'm a bit nervous, a bit embarrassed, whatever it is. What it shows like really perfectly is even though we're really capable of a certain skill, and in this case, it's reading and identifying letters of the English alphabet. Sometimes we can bypass certain things in our brain. We're sort of like hardwired to make things easy. So like psychologists call it heuristics. So we'll look for shortcuts to make things easy for ourselves. What we're going to find out is that referees do this too. It's something called cue learning. So we can look at certain cues or things that we might rely upon and think to ourselves, right, that's the only information I'm going to take. Now, the difficulty is the more expert we come at something, the more we streamline because we become really efficient at it. So I guess the positive uh, for the guys that didn't get full marks on this is that you're so good at reading and you're so good at identifying it. So you can bypass those odds because they don't really matter. You still understood the sentence. The danger is, is as we become better reps, when we become more qualified and more experienced, we don't want to ignore certain information. Clive Woodward illustrated with his rugby players really well that they would often ignore huge chunks of space on the rugby field and that actually damaged their performance. What I was interested in is how can I apply this to refereeing? And that leads me to my title page. So my name is Stuart Carrington. I'm the author of this book, Blowing the Whistle, The Psychology of Football Refereeing. A uh, small bit of background about me. I'm a lecturer at St. Mary's University. It's already been mentioned there. Um, I work with the psychology team, uh, the sociology team, but ma mainly I work in the coaching team because that's where my area of interest and expertise mainly sits. So I wanted to write a book for a few reasons. And this is really a really telling question. Someone all, always kind of like ask me, why referees? Why write a book about referees? I've had some people say no one cares about the referee. I've had someone say that uh, we shouldn't care about the referee. Um, I also was interested in why people referee in the first place. Um, for me, the answer to that question, is, uh, sorry, the fact that that question is asked is really telling. Like, why referees? Why write a book about referees? Well, a referee is one of three agents that can influence a game of football. Football is the most popular game on the planet. It is Britain's most successful export including T. That's how successful the British Premier League is. There are three teams that compete in a football match. Team A, Team B and the officiating team. The only difference with the officiating team is they have no vested interest in the outcome of the game. They do not go onto the field of players, I'm sure you're aware, thinking I want the team in red to win or I want the team in blue to win or so on and so forth. That said, they can influence a game of football and it would be naive if they dare to think they can't. Despite this huge significance and this huge importance around this global game of football, there's in, an incredible lack of research and insight into this area. When engaging with, the res, in, with this research, I felt to myself, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a small comparison and see how much work is done on coaches, on players. If I type in performance football players or performance football coaches, I'm going to get around 750,000 hits on any university database. If I type in the same thing, but rather than typing in players or coaches, I type in officials, I get about 75,000. So it's about 10%. So 10% of the research done on the world's most popular game with huge economic and social value is done on one third of the factors that can influence the outcome. I found that quite eye opening. So it seems they're kind of misunderstood and often much maligned. 
Referees are often a subject of criticism when they are discussed. It's very rare that people will discuss the performance of a referee in a positive outcome, particularly in the media. If they are positive, it tends to come as a one kind of throwaway line rather than looking at the science or the depth behind it. Much There's a great disparity between what they do when a player does something well or a coach does something well. I'm going to talk a bit about that and why that might be later on. Finally, we look at like culturally disliked. So one thing that the, that the research uh, in the area does show is that this dislike or distrust of the referee is not specific to any one nation. Uh, you can go to any nation in Europe, you can go to Australia, you can go to New Zealand, you can go to South America, you can go to North America. Uh, we mentioned earlier, Ron, I've been doing a lot of these talks with the Canadian uh, referee associations at the moment. And, and they're like, yeah, like, why is this? Like, this just seems everyone seems to want to sort of like bash the official. Like, why is this? When I wrote the book, I wasn't a referee. Um, obviously, I'm a big football fan, and I have a background in playing, and I have a background in coaching, but I wasn't a referee, so I didn't go in into this as a ref referee sympathizer, as it's been put, because I think some people that write the book, particularly the conclusion of the book, looks at like how we can make our, uh, the referee's job a little bit easier, and about why it's everybody's um, responsibility to do so. And it kind of like, annoys me a little bit when people say oh this is another sort of like ref referee sympathizer because when you become engaged with the literature not only do you appreciate what a hard job it is you also appreciate how good the referees are that do this job week in week out and how difficult it is to stay committed that said my naivety going into the book was really about answering certain questions these are the questions that i wanted to answer as a football fan and i'm sure that you may have asked these sort of questions yourself or you've certainly heard them or had them level to you so have you not seen that ref? How many do they get ref? That's a good one. I used to say this all the time as a coach. Um, so I guess the first thing I need to do is apologize to any of you if you've uh, ever, ever refereed a game while I've been the coach. Because I used to say that deliberately to try to manipulate the ref. Very conniving, I used to say it very deliberately to try to get referees to um, start showing yellow cards to opposition players. Of course, when it was my player, it was, oh, that's his first one, or oh, it's only two, or oh, that was just an accident, and so on and so forth. This ref is so arrogant. There's a really interesting question that I get, is, you know, do, do are referees all arrogant, aren't they? You have to be a certain type of person to want to be a referee. You've got to be a bit of a big head, a bit of a control freak. Um, there's, there is a lot of research into this area about personalities and referees, and, and you can actually answer this question quite well. I'm happy to do that later on. Um, he or she doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, totally false, but it's something that referees get accused of often. All those things in mind, that abuse and all those like, criticisms that get kind of aimed at officials, kind of maybe want to answer that. Like, why do it? Why does anyone do it? And the one answer that referees across the board, doesn't matter their gender, doesn't matter their age, doesn't matter ethnicity, doesn't matter where they're from, they all answer the same thing, because I love the game. And that high level of intrinsic motivation is really important. We know from a psychological perspective, people with high levels of intrinsic motivation, they persist, they strategize in their own time, they uh, talk and discuss issues with other people, developing learning, and they're less likely to drop out. So we know that intrinsic motivation is really, really important for referees, and we also know that referees have it in spades. When I start to think about the role of referee, I often think of it like an arbiter. So for those that may speak Spanish or Italian or other Latin languages, we know that the, the word in those languages for referees are vitro. And it comes directly from the term arbiter. An arbiter is someone who has to pass judgment based on information given to them by one or two other parties. Now, if that's not a referee, I don't know what is. I started to think to myself, are there any, any other people that that definition can apply to? And the clearest example is this gentleman in front of us right now, the courtroom judge. The courtroom judge is an arbiter. He or she has the job of gathering information from different people that are each trying to persuade them to have one outcome over the other. And quite shockingly, they have lots of advantages in their favor. They have complete and absolute control and discipline, something that referees like, but sometimes can't avoid losing. They also have time on their hands. They can deliberate for as much as they want. They can seek counsel from others as much as they want. We know in the Premier League that can't happen even with VAR. We also know that an arbiter, uh, sorry, we also know that this arbiter has lots and lots of psychological preparation, theory, research, and background in their favor. 
there's something that's, that's labeled primacy recency effects. A primacy recency effect will determine what you remember the most. If you're an expert in an area, you will remember the first thing you hear the most. So if you have two conflicting arguments, the expert will tend to go with the first thing. If you don't have an idea about what you're listening to, you tend to go with the last thing. You tend to remember the last thing you've heard, most importantly, which is why the defense goes last in jury cases, because the jury aren't experts, so it makes it harder to prosecute. All that in mind, the, this arbiter has to deal with certain things. They have to deal with that kind of flash, silk-tongued lawyer with the shiny shoes, trying to persuade them to go one way or the other. But they do have time on their hands and they have counsel. A football referee doesn't have that liberty. To put this into perspective, I want to talk about some numbers. On your chat, could you please write in how many decisions you think a football referee makes on average in a 90 minute match? Oh, here we go, starting to come in. 500. I feel like a, an auctioneer, any take on 500. Sean's gone lower, 100. 120, 250. 300, 395. It's very specific, 395, not 400. Daddy! I have a woman <coughs> Any others? Anyone else want to guess? Av average number of decisions per per ninety minute match? Any more? No. Oh, okay. A oh, thousand. Wow, Jay. I, I can tell you that's quite high. But you might be right if we think about non decisions as well. So one thing I would say is that people often assume that decisions are the ones that you can see. Now, this area is a little bit flawed because. When you start to study refereeing decisions, you can only study things you actually know that are happening. If a referee, for example, I'm sure we've all done this, has seen something and you thought, I could give that, but I'm not going to, and you let something go, that's a decision. A non-decision is a decision. So Joe, take heart of the fact that if you include non-decisions, you're probably closest. But I'd say closest, you're looking at in between Martin and Shell. So it's about 350, okay? So around 350 decisions per 90 minute match. Of those 350, around 50 are objective. So you as an official will have about 50 occasions in that match where it's the ball crossed the line or it didn't cross the line. The ball came off the red-shirted player first or it came off the blue-shirted player first. The ball was, uh, it went in the goal or it wasn't a goal. Something like that. That means that 300 decisions are purely subjective. It's all down to your interpretation. And that interpretation could be attributed and influenced by many, many things. I was really, really interested in that. The reason this is so important is not only because A, an official has so much influence over a game, but B, if we know that we can influence subjective and personal perception, as we saw with counting the letter F exercise earlier on, what can we, if we know more we know about it, the more we can combat it, and finally, we wanted to know what else could affect it. Another interesting stat in numbers about the what of refereeing is there's no temporal bias. So essentially, those decisions, although it's 350, and it averages at one every 12 seconds, by the way, it doesn't mean you're going to have one every 12 seconds. You might go 200 seconds without having to do anything. You might go 300 seconds. You might go five minutes. You might have two minutes where you make a lot of decisions. You might have a time where you had to make a 50-50 decision, you chose to let it go, and it led to a big decision, and you wish you could go back to the smaller decision. But that non-decision counted as an outcome. Go back to our other arbiter. Think about all the research and help a courtroom judge gets. They are not making a decision every 12 seconds, and they do not have the influences you guys have. I wanted to write a book to expose some of that literature that I engage quite heavily with in order to help referees understand the influences that they're under. And I want to present that for you now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of those influences and discuss their importance in light of the literature. What I also want to do is kind of take you on a little whistle-stop tour of the book. 
oh, I don't know why that video is there because it shouldn't be there. The video won't play, by the way, very well on Zoom, so apologies for that. Here's a, an aggression chart, and the aggression chart is there to show a couple of things. The first thing it shows is, by, is a study by uh, three researchers, Jones, Paul, and Erskine in 2002. And to look at one of what is one of the things that might influence a referee's subjective decision making prior knowledge of, a, of an individual or a team's level of aggression. The darker grey bars on the left of those sides, they show the group of referees that were told that team A are particularly aggressive. They've accumulated a lot of yellow and red cards during the season so far, and they've got certain players that are very reckless, dangerous or aggressive in their tackles. And they were asked to watch a game. The light grey uh, bars on the right-hand side, they, were, they weren't told about reputation. They were just told, just watch this game of football, tell us if you give a foul at certain points, and if you are going to penalise a player, would you also penalise with a card? And if so, what colour card are you giving? What is quite significant, and the research shows it's quite significant, and hopefully you can see it on this bar chart here, is on the right-hand side, the number of cards shown when a group was told about reputation for the other team was quite low compared to when they're unaware. So the team that are unaware of a team's rep, the, the group of referees that were told that were told anything about this particular team's reputation, they were given the same amount of fouls for both teams. They felt that the team in blue and the team in red, they committed about the same amount of fouls. Whereas the team that were told about the reputation of say the blue team, they gave not only a significantly less number of fouls to the other team, so they rewarded the other team with less punishment, they penalised the aggressive team much more severely, and that's significant. It's over double. So if you're looking at a 50% swing in decisions, that can heavily influence the outcome of a football match. This is really important because a question I often get asked is how much homework or research should a referee do? Another really prominent researcher in sports officiating is a guy called Dr. Tom Webb. He wrote a superb book called uh, Elite Soccer Refereeing. And one of the major points or major outcomes that Tom concludes is that there's a big discrepancy in the level of research and homework that referees do in Serie A, the referees do in La Liga, and the referees do in the Premier League. On the continent, referees do a lot more research and homework and they are on record as saying they like to look at which players have a reputation for diving which players have a reputation for aggressive play what sort of teams play in a very aggressive way how many yellow cards has this team accumulated over the season are there any players that are easier to control once you've got them in the book early premier league referees tend to report that they do homework but it tends to be more tactical and uh, technical i.e what sort of Football, does this team like to play? Do they like to play out from the back? Do they play long diagonal balls? Where should I be to get into position? If the winger gets the ball, do they like to cut inside or do they like to go on the outside of the full back? Those, that type of homework would definitely help and aid a referee's performance because we know that positioning will improve the chance of getting a better decision. I believe that referees on the continent may be doing too much homework regarding the level of aggression, number of yellow cards, number of red cards. And that would be backed up by the literature. It's something I hope to explore a little bit further. So reputation, aggression of a team, that could be an influence. If we talk about another thing that could be an influence, it could be very personal to the referee. It could be the type of attention that the referee holds. We have a look at this diagram here. We have four different types of attention and all of them are really important to referees. The first one, top left, is assessment. This is broad and external. This is probably the type of attention that you have more often than not when you officiate a game of football. Broad external is when you're trying to observe the actions of everything going on around you. So you're not focusing on any one particular thing, you want to see as much as you can. It's the sort of um, assessment you might do immediately before kickoff, i.e. counting players, looking at general pitch conditions, where the sun is, things like that. Maybe when the ball goes out of play, you might step back, you have another look around, that's broad external. You can go from broad external to external narrow, and you can do that very quickly. So for example, 
assume that you're refereeing a football match and a throw's gone to the red team. You might step back, you're looking around, trying to figure out the best position. They take a very quick throw, catches everyone off guard, and now their winger is one-on-one -on -one with a fullback. You're now probably going to start exercising a very external, narrow type of attention because you want to see what that fullback does in great detail. If they make a tackle, you want to see the contact, you want to see the speed, you want to see the direction, you want to see the intent, you want to see if it's reckless, dangerous, excessive, clean. This is external narrow because you're not seeing anything else that's going on. It, they may make the tackle, but you don't know what's going on off the ball, if someone's making a run, something like that. It's not your job to, but it's your job to go from very broad external to external narrow very, very quickly. I'm gonna come on to the importance of that in a moment. But before I do, let's go down to analyze. Analyze can be broad internal. So this could be planning for the game. It could be at half time. You might be thinking about lots of things. You might be thinking, right, what did that winger do often? How did that guy react when I spoke to him? Who's on a yellow card? Is there anyone I need to watch? How do I think the conditions are going to fare in the second half? How do I think the other team are going to react to being 3-0 down? This is all to do with insights, like your internal monologue, but you're thinking about lots of things. And then you can go to an internal monologue, but be very narrow. This can be done before the game, trying to relax yourself before a game, a couple of deep breaths, or it could be, be, be during the game. You've just made a really big decision. It might be a little bit controversial. Some people might not agree with it. It's really important for an official to then be able to switch and go, well, I need to just concentrate on myself try to affect the decision I just made and move on to the next one. Two really key examples of why this is important. Let's look at external narrow in the top right. A lady that I've had a real great pleasure in discussing officiating with is former FIFA referee uh, and uh, trainer, Janie Frampton. And Janie Frampton was telling me about a Premier League referee, former Premier League referee. And before I start, a question I always get is, oh, can you tell us some names? And I'm not going to name drop. Uh, because often these incidences are given to me in absolute trust and, and, I, and I wouldn't like to violate any anonymity here. And this particular former Premier League referee was taken off the games for a particular Premier League club because this Premier League club said in the last 12 games that this person has officiated, we should have had 12 penalties, a penalty a game, and we didn't get one. So I'm not in, like, we don't want this person officiating. The PGMO looked at it and they were right. The, the, the club was right. This particular person had missed all these penalties. When asked, this referee said, I just felt the player had gone down too easily. I think they have a bit of a reputation. I'm not, you know, I, I didn't think there were penalties. When they started to review the incidences, they were like, we think you're wrong. You, you know, maybe nine of them are definite penalties and the other three are 50 50, but you're definitely wrong on a lot of them. So what they did was, they hooked up this referee to a gaze monitor. They could see where this particular official was looking when it's one on one. But what they found was when he was watching this particular player, he was looking at the, the attacking player's legs. And that was it. His attention was so good and he was so excellent at focusing. And he thought to himself, this player and this particular player in question was very fast and very tricky. I'm just going to focus at the attacking player's legs. It's a little bit like the count the Fs thing. You're so good at it. Your, your, your attention is too narrow. What they asked him to do was actually try to take a kind of a, a cognitive step back and take a little bit more information in. Switch between broad external to exter uh, an external narrow, a little less extreme, so you can have a bit more information. With that more information, you'll make a better decision. Lo and behold, he starts to make better decisions. His ranking starts to improve. The next area that I said I'd give you a, a, an example to illustrate a little bit more is this one, prepare. Narrow internal, taking a deep breath to relax, self-talk, etc. During your game, it's really important for referees to move on from one decision to the next. Really, really hard to do, but we know there are certain techniques that can help. When I interviewed some referees for the book, a lot of them said they practice self-talk during the game. For example, if they felt they were behind with play, they would say to the, each other or themselves, keep up. Their officials would say, try to keep up with play, keep going. If they made a bad decision and the official might say to his assistant, did I get that one wrong? They would say, maybe forget about it and move on. Next one, next one. They would just keep saying like little mantras like this all the time. I think having like stock phrases of self-talk to help you do that is really important. And we know that because of an effect called a simulation effect. And a simulation effect is where 
you start to think about each decision as a memory. I was in Las Vegas once. If you haven't been, I highly recommend you go, but don't take too much money. It's the fastest way in the world to lose money quickly. And uh, I went over to the roulette machine and we put you know, $20 on red and we spin it, we spin it, we spin it around, it goes on black. And then my wife has a go. And she's like, okay, well, I'll go red. And then we spin it, it spins, 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 and it goes on black. And then we think, all right, should we just go again? You know, one more time. I said, what one do you want to put it on? She went, well, it's got to be red now because the last two have been black. And I was like, the ball doesn't have a memory. It doesn't remember that the last two times you spun the wheel, it fell on black, so now it's going to go red. Every time you spin, it's 50-50. And I know there's always a mathematician there that says, well, one of them's green, so it's not. But you know what I mean. The thing is, we're human beings. We do have a memory. So we know that when we make a decision, that might be in the back of our head. Did I do that one a little bit wrong? Do I need to even it up a little bit? Referees, of course, never intend to do this, but it's hard to get away from. And that's why switching to a narrow internal is really important. One really interesting study was done where they asked the legal referees to look at a game between Real Madrid and Real Sociedad. And the reason they picked this particular game was because Madrid have a very good penalty claim within the first two minutes of the match. And then like 10 minutes later, Sociedad have a very similar penalty claim. And then 10 minutes after that, Madrid get another strong penalty claim. What they did was they showed 100 referees this in laboratory conditions. And as soon as the foul was made, they stopped. So they didn't know what the on-field referee actually did. And they just said, do you give the penalty or not? If they gave the first penalty, 100% of those refs that gave Madrid their penalty gave Sociedad theirs. If they didn't give the first penalty, the number of referees that gave Sociedad's dropped by exactly half, goes to 50%. Then the ones that didn't give Madrid's first, but did give Sociedad's, guess what? 100% give Madrid their ones. That's an assimilation effect. What's really interesting for me as a researcher is why that is. And we know that that's something called social bias or a social payoff. It's an area of research I can't talk too much about now because I'm actually looking into it at the moment. But what I want to look at is how much does that, I want social approval. I want people to believe that I'm impartial because I am impartial, actually make an official less partial. Let's skip those videos a little bit. One area that I always get asked about is what does the effect of crowd noise or fans have on a referee? And this is particular per particularly pertinent now because of the current situation of games behind closed doors. The answer is huge. Crowd noise has been researched a lot. So we know that there are two main outputs of crowd noise. The first is what I label in the book as influence on opportunity. We know that a referee a home game is more likely to play a significantly increased amount of added time if the home team is losing by one goal margin one nil two one three two etc so essentially if the home team is losing by one goal the amount of added time that that referee is likely to play increases some researchers attribute this to a psychological phenomenon called um, charity bias i.e you might feel bad for someone if they're losing and therefore you want to kind of give them an opportunity to make it up there's an element of truth in that because we know that when the away team is losing by one goal margin, there's slightly more time played, but it's nowhere near as much as when the home team is losing. So the only difference can be the location. And we know that location all look the same. You know, pitch is a pitch and a goal is a goal, but the crowd are very different and it's a very partisan crowd. We also know that there's a different output and that output is influence on discipline. So we know that referees will tend to do couple of things differently in in front of a big crowd they will a let the home team go with more fouls b they will punish the away team more severely what referees do really well is not punish the away team with more fouls so to speak so it's not a case of oh well it's 50 50 i'm definitely giving it to the home team so referees have to be applauded there what is important though is that if an away team makes a foul they are more likely to receive a yellow card than the home team in fact they're about 50% more likely, one in two. In no Premier League season since it began, and we're in the 26th now, has the away team averaged more yellow cards than the home team over the course of the season. Might happen in a one-off game, but on average. 
only one season has the home team averaged more red cards, and that was so small it was actually statistically insignificant. Why is that? Well, we know that there's three things that will influence the crowd on the referee. The first is crowd proximity, i.e. if the crowd are particularly close to the officials playing surface, officials are more likely to make decisions that favour the home team. The second thing is crowd density, so how much of the crowd is sold out, uh, the stadium is sold out. So you might have a really nice big stadium, but if you're not selling it out, it's not going to impact the official as much. And the third one is crowd volume, so how loud that crowd is. You could have a really big stadium, lots and lots of people, but if it's really, really quiet, it doesn't really have too much of an effect. The reason this is really important is because referees will always come back and say, it's like working with a radio one, I don't really hear it. Some referees even said to me, if a player speaks to me, I can't even hear them. Like, I have to take out my mic, or I have to ask them to repeat it. So I'm not really influenced. Of course, a referee is not consciously influenced, but we're talking about what's going on at a subconscious level. And we know that statistically and in lab conditions, they are influenced. And we know that when we look at the empirical evidence of games and the statistics that come out of actual football matches, there seems to be a favoritism towards the home team. What I wanted to do in the book is look at like, why is that? It's all very well saying, well, yeah, that might happen, but why? And there's a number of reasons why. I can't give everything away, but one thing I would say is I believe that it imp impacts our decision-making in terms of implicit versus explicit. We know that when you're coaching, and bear in mind my background is in sports coaching, if you're trying to get someone to acquire a new skill, implicit coaching might take longer, but they tend to retain that information and they tend to retain that skill execution better. So what essentially this means is if you tell someone how to do something very, very explicitly, they'll learn really, really quickly. But what happens under pressure is they kind of, they, result, they, they revert back to being a novice. Let me give you an example. Next time you're making a cup of tea or coffee, give like commentate to yourself. Imagine you're John Watson and actually be very much like, right, so I'm going to take my right hand and I'm going to grip the handle of the kettle. And then with my left hand, I'm going to turn on the tap and I'm going to turn on the tap counterclockwise. Be that specific. Comment to yourself. Do the whole thing. One, you'll get really tired because you'll be like, oh my God, it's so automatic for me. Your performance will decrease. It sounds weird. Your performance in making tea will decrease. But you'll find it doesn't flow as much. I would say do it while you're driving, but it might be a little bit dangerous. But if you're doing a very simple driving maneuver, talk to yourself while you do it and say what you're doing. I'm dipping the clutch. I'm changing, changing the gear. Your performance won't be as good. What we know is that when we learn a skill, we learn it in a cognitive stage. So we have to think about it. So when you did learn to drive, you did have to be told, dip the clutch, change gear, put your hand on the steering wheel, do this, do that. But now you're so good at it, you can probably drive to work and don't even know how you've done it. When you're a referee, we know that the one caveat that we have to all this research is this. The more qualified, the more trained, and the more expert the referee is, the less influence they are by crowd noise, the less influenced that they are by player reputation. And that's because they're going on instinct. They just do it. I believe the crowd noise starts to put doubt in the official's head, i.e. player makes a foul. If, you've, if you don't think it's a foul, but 60,000 people jump up and scream foul, suddenly you might start to think a little bit more explicitly. Does that alter your attention? Do you start to focus on the wrong things? Are you worried you might miss something? Does it increase assimilation effects? You can see how these things come together to impact referee performance. I call crowd noise the bolero for refs. The reason I say this is because we know that referees in football aren't alone in this area. Ice skating judges, expert judges, you can show them an ice dance done by the same people with no music. They'll score it X. You then show the music that doesn't suit the dance at all, that the dance wasn't intended to be danced to, and it goes down. You then show them the same dance to a perfect piece of music like Torval and Dean's Bolero, and the score goes up. That's how influenced we are by our perception from other areas and other influences and other factors. There's also another number of influences on the performance of a referee, and this is one, uh, so I, I'm, I feel awful already. Um, Alex, Sean, I, I, I apologize. I forgot the sociologist uh, in the Cardiff City Stadium here. Um, I'm sure it's gonna come up on the chat in a moment. It's me, um, who you might be interested in. What I wanted to do in the book was show how our psychology as individuals cannot be isolated 
from our sociological environment. Neither can it be separated from our historical influence. And this is because who we are doesn't exist in a vacuum. We're influenced by the effect of history and we're influenced by the effects of other people. As referees, we should be really aware of that because the role is essentially try to influence people constantly to manage and control behavior. There's a cultural distrust of officials and this is worldwide. This isn't uh, specific to any nation. There are some nations which do report higher levels of referee acceptance and um, gratitude to the referee's role. Uh, the Netherlands is one, but to think that that's a utopia would, would certainly be a mistake. We also know that it's socially acceptable to criticise or abuse the referee. So I actually present examples in my book of referees in, in, in England being criticised in mainstream media in the early 1900s, um, being threatened in the late 1800s. We have this distrust, particularly in the UK, because of a heavily ingrained class system. It, it was traditionally the case of, well, we don't need an official because we can just have captains. And when there's a dispute, the captains will come together and they'll talk about a decision and then they will agree what will happen. And when football became professional in the late 1800s, it was deemed as, well, hang on, now people have got maybe a financial purpose, they might cheat. And some people, sometimes they can't agree. So we'll have an arbiter who stands off the field who will just say yay or nay to a certain appeal. And then it got to the point was, well, you can't see from there, so you have to be on the field and so on and so forth. You can see the dawn of this. So first of all, the upper class started to distrust the referee because they were thinking, you know, we're kind of, we're gentlemen, you don't need to do this Corinthian spirit, all of that. And then as the game became more professional and became more working class, particularly in the north of England, the people that had to be the officials had to be the ones that could understand the law books. These were old, old boys of school networks, particularly in the southern uh, counties. So it became, a, oh, who's this guy telling me what to do? This Harrow or Eton Toff telling me like, how I'm supposed to be playing the game. All of this stems and starts to dilute this attitude towards refereeing. And when we look at refereeing in other countries, particularly South America and Latin countries, we can see the corruption of government has a massive impact. And I discuss this in the book to some extent. The reason it's important is it has a massive effect on the recruitment, the retention and the mental health of sports officials. In part two of the book, I look at this in quite a lot of detail. To highlight how culturally significant the abuse of referees or criticism of referees is just so accepted, I'd like to show you a clip from The Simpsons. Then what should I do? Just squeeze your rage into a bitter little ball and release it at an appropriate time. Like that day I hit the referee with a whiskey bottle. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. When daddy hit the referee? Yeah. Yeah. It just perfectly encapsulates a couple of things. One, we think that when we come to regulate our emotions, we should do that in day-to-day -day lives. But we don't need to regulate our emotions when we're playing sports. This is completely untrue. One, people that can regulate emotions really well actually perform better when they're playing sports and people that don't regulate their emotions well. So when people are kind of saying, oh, well, you know, I'm just showing my passion, I'm just showing my enthusiasm for something. Actually, they'd actually do better if they were to taper that, so, uh, sorry, temper that somehow. The second thing it shows is this cultural acceptance. I remember watching this cartoon, probably when I was like 15, I'm just laughing, just thinking that was a funny joke and not questioning what was really going on. One Premier League referee, tells this story of a time where he took his 10 year old daughter to watch a local football match. And everyone starts shouting abuse at the referee. And she says, daddy, why are those people shouting at that guy? And he says, oh, that's football, it's what you do. And then instantly he's like saying, what am I doing? Like I'm teaching my daughter that this is actually just like perfectly acceptable. I'm not questioning this behavior. It's just what you do. In the book, I like to talk about the reasons behind that, how it affects referee behavior, and it does affect it decision-making in, in, in quite a significant way. And it also impacts the recruitment, retention, and mental health of the people that follow this, this path. Oh. oh, sorry, I had Homer and Lisa talking again there. Here's the good news though, and I'll open up the chat again. If we took 100 professional German Bundesliga players, and showed them a hundred clips of refereeing decisions. And there's a yellow card, red card, offside, onside, things like that. What percentage of decisions do you think the players as a group get right? What percentage of decisions do you think players get right?
40, 30, 25, 20, 25, 70. Okay, nice little mix, 80. Okay, Mark, you're the closest, 55. So it's actually, it's 50. So players get 50% of decisions right. Right, this is one in two. So one in two decisions players get right. Think about if you went onto a football pitch. Think about how the players would react to you if you were getting one in two decisions correct. Think about what their evaluation of your performance might be and importantly, how they might let you know that. When people say, you have never played the game ref, I'm sure you might have heard that, or you don't know what you're doing, something like this. What this does is it ignores the fact that officiating is a role-specific skill. If you're a footballer, if someone tells you they're a footballer, the next question you normally ask is, what position do you play? If they say that you're a striker, and then you say, oh, I'm going to put you in goal, they'll probably complain and say, well, I'm no good at that. Why is it, therefore, that players, and this statistic proves it is without foundation, assume they can do that job as well as the referee? We know they can't. That doesn't mean a player wouldn't make a good referee. I get that a lot. I get RC saying players can't be good refs. No, no, no. They could be. It's just not a prerequisite for being a good ref. Referees, if you look at a panel of referees, will get those decisions 80% right. So referees tend to agree on 80% of those. So we know the players are underperforming when it comes to referees and by a quite substantial amount. The importance of this. Oh, chat. Is that professional league? Yeah. Yes, it was. So it was done with professional uh, Bundesliga officials. Doesn't mean that's not. Yeah, and professional Bundesliga players. It would be interesting to see uh, if you could do this study or replicate this study. You've given me an idea now uh, with lower lower league officials, even if it was like amateur league. Um, and, and seeing what the players and, and officials came up with there. What we do know is that the ability of players and officials tends to match up because the level of experience, training and expertise go kind of hand in hand. Uh, I would completely agree with you, Alex. I'd also extend that to the media. So let's uh, move on. And this is a question, but please feel free to keep firing them out. I'll keep this up for a little bit. Um, let me move on. It's a role specific skill. Any roles, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let me move this away. Any role specific skill entails certain things. It entails training. So think about the jobs that you do. They're role specific. You're probably very good at your jobs because of a couple of things. One, the experience you recruit. Why is it so important that you know when we recruit people, we want someone with experience? Well, because they've seen things, they've made mistakes, and they've learned and they've developed. We also know that they get provided training. So you've trained to do certain things. So you may not know a lot about a certain area, or you may not have experience in a certain area, but with time, you can acquire these things. One thing that's not done enough of with officiating is psychological skills training, or PST. When asked, rugby league officials actually ranked the top 10 skills for officiating. The first six, not even six of the top 10, the first six are exclusively psychological. Things like communication skills, perception skills, decision-making skills, people management skills, conflict resolution. These are exclusively psychological skills. And yet we know that on many steps of the refereeing ladder, there is no psychological training offered to the recruits, uh, to the, to the recruits at all. PST is also the fastest growing area of referee development. In the last 10 years, not one area has seen a greater increase with the exception of video training. And that's probably because it's coupled quite nicely with advances in technology, mobile phones, internet speeds, things like that. We also know that it's the area that not only is the fastest growing, but referees ask for the most. They're demanding it. They're actually saying, I want more. When referees turned professional in 2001, the blanket assumption would be this is going to be great for referees because everyone's going to become fitter they're going to be able to get into positions better and see things better that's true it certainly did aid the fitness of, 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 of an official what no one really looked at though was all these other demands and we know these demands are only getting harder from 2008 to 2013 the english premier league got 20 percent faster 
That means that an average speed of a player increased by 20%. The distance covered increased by 20%. The number of incidents increased 20%. Not only that, but think about the increased media scrutiny on players and referees and teams nowadays. It can only add to that pressure. That can only be dealt with officially and dealt and do and uh, and aided with psychological skills training. I was really fortunate to converse with a colleague, uh, Roy Samuel, who works at uh, the University in Tel Aviv in Israel. And Roy has prepared um, this psychological preparedness uh, ladder. Now, what I like about the ladder is that he allowed me to adapt it. So this isn't Roy's, but mine, so it's adapted from his. And the reason I adapted it is I just wanted to include a couple of things in there that might be more relevant to lower level referees. I wanted his ladder was purely for elite level referees. And that's great, but they all elite level referees already receive psychological training. They already receive psychological guidance. I wanted to offer referees at all levels a kind of go-to guide to give themselves a model of how to prepare psychologically for a game. Part three of the book is purely devoted to this and what referees can do at each stage. I won't go through each stage now, but what I can do is talk about maybe one or two areas. The first one, allocation of match and referee crew, really, really important. When I interviewed some referees, they would say one thing that stressed them out is if their colleagues got to the game late. So they had to do the pitch inspection by themselves or a brief by themselves. Or if their colleagues went and they weren't in a suit, but they were, something like that. They said it would stress them out. They said they started to think about that rather than the game. They started to think, can I trust this person? It started to kind of, automatically create a little bit of hostility and therefore communication might have been damaged. So what can we do weeks before the game to help our psychological preparation? If we go down to planning, psychological, technical, tactical, and mental, can we start to think about mental stimulation that we can do? Can we start to think about our pre-performance routine in the preparation stage? Can we start to think about technical planning but not just technical planning in terms of where I might be on the pitch at any one time. Could we start to think about planning in terms of what would I do if someone did this? Rehearsals, stock phrases. When we talk about our performance, how can I go from a broad external to a narrow internal type of attention very quickly and then go back again very quickly because I know that's going to benefit my performance. What psychological intervention can I do that's quick and practical to help me do that? And then finally, how can I assess? Who should I be assessing with? How often should I do it? In order to present this information to you in the book, what I do is I wanted to engage with academic literature as much as possible, but I wanted to present it in a way that was A, accessible. So I don't talk about statistical analysis. I don't talk about P or R values because essentially no one cares. I wanted to do all that hard work for, for the reader and say, we know that this experiment was sound, we know that it was significant. We know that these results can be trusted. This is what essentially was, was, was discovered. But importantly, what I wanted to do was I wanted to cross-reference it to what fans say and what the media says. Throughout the book, I've got quotes from people's Twitter comments about referees. I'll have little snippets or quotes from newspapers or phrases that you might hear, you know, people like uh, Gary Neville or Jamie Carragher say on Monday Night Football about an official. And then... I'll use that to ask the question, is this true? Or is this just a myth that needs to be busted? And what evidence can I use to bust that myth? The book is, part one is about the influences of a referee. It talks about things like location, crowd noise, talks about the reputation of players, coaches and clubs, and the effect of appeals on a referee. Part two, I start to break it down and look at the importance of individual differences because every referee is different. When you step onto that pitch, you take yourself with you. You take your emotions with you. And we know that your emotions will play a part in the decisions you make that day. Importantly, I look at how good referees are at regulating their emotions and how referees need to understand how to regulate emotions in order to help control others and manage behaviors. I talk a little bit about the ref and wider society and about how we can start to challenge this perception of referees as someone who's just there to be bashed or abused. And then finally, we look at psychological training of a referee. What can a referee do to prepare for a match? And what can a referee do during the match? 
finally, what can everybody do to help referees? And that responsibility doesn't just lie with the officials or governing bodies. It lies with the media, it lies with players, it lies with coaches, and it lies with fans. Thank you very much for letting me talk. I've, you know, I felt like I've talked for a, a long time. My wife, who probably can hear me just outside there, is probably thinking, yes, you can. I can talk about this all night, so please feel free to ask any questions you like. Um, it's up to... I'm in there to decide whether you want to do it via the chat or do it with people taking their mics off. Um, it's, it's your show. Thanks very much for listening. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Stuart. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, as for um, you know, um, trying to manage us now. So if you if you wanted to um, ask a question, then by all means, uh, turn your mic on, or you can uh, go through the chat. Um, I. Um, just wondering, you know, when you when you talked about um, um, the referees doing homework, no, mm -hmm. referees doing homework on teams. Mm -hmm. Do teams tend to do homework on the referees and say, well, you know, do they do they mod moderate their behaviour as a result? Superb question. How shocking is this, right? Think about if you if you were um, a manager or a coach or a backroom staff member of an elite European football team okay so i'm talking your Bayern munichs your ac milan's your man united's etc and you were going to play a really high level match now not only does that match have massive implications for your success as a coach but it also has massive financial implications for the club as a whole because we know the financial awards that come along in with these certain competitions games think about the homework they do on the opposition the dossiers they produce the fitness graphs they produce the you know where might this guy take a penalty kick in all the research that i did i got one piece of evidence back about a team doing a piece of research on a referee and it was from a national team coach and this national team coach it was at under 21 level said one time they found out that the referee doesn't speak english and had shown a lot of red cards that season. And they stuck an A4 sheet of paper on the dressing room door and it had ref and then equals and they wrote the referee's name. They put like, I'm making this bit up now, but like 10 reds or whatever it was mm. and doesn't speak English. That is the extent of research that I have found anyone doing on referees. And I find that incredible. So you're absolutely right. Mm. That said, I've spoken to some members of the National RA earlier on the week, and they've come back to me and said that they have started to hear about lower league sides that might come across the same referee often, knowing what they tend to like and what they tend to not like in terms of things like chat back or uh, you know, do they give a lot of penalties and things like that. So we know it's starting to happen. So I think the importance of the referee is starting to increase. Mm. However, the the short answer to your question there is none. Is people just don't do it. Yeah, and then and is, is there a cor correlation of some sort between uh, the behaviour of the team and and their and their relative success? Uh, yes and no. So we know that you can have teams that are particularly aggressive and yet still be very successful. Um, what we have found is that the governing body governing bodies have become much more effective at managing that so essentially punishments are a lot harsher so we don't see teams like surrounding officials like we used to in the mid 90s you know with the famous man united team doing it often and things like this um with regards to lower levels we know that aggression can impact referee performance because at lower levels referees are often alone and they're more like when you're alone you're more likely to conform and you're more likely to conform particularly in the face of aggression that of course is tempered by an individual difference um i've had one referee say that they will allow a certain amount of aggression intimidation but as soon as you cross the line they say you failed my test and i'm not giving you anything so i guess the short answer there is it it's individual difference an individual difference um and how a referee can uh, regulate that emotion is discussed quite extensively in part two of the book where I'll tackle that question. Right. Um, I've got a question. Hi, Jay. Um, hi. Have you looked at, at all how, in, say, rugby particularly, all the players respect the referee mm -hmm. and they don't 
chat back with his decision. They always think he's always seen as the good guy and he's made the right decision, even though often sometimes they get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And have you looked at maybe why that is and why that doesn't carry over into football? Yeah, there's a couple of answers to that, Joe. It's a really good question because a lot of people say, well, what can we learn from other sports? So the first one is that there's a social and historical background to that. So like I mentioned in part two of the book, I'll talk about um, why people in football tend to distrust referees. With rugby, it, they'd never had that class divide. So uh, the referees and the players predominantly came from the same socioeconomic background and therefore there was no discrepancy and no kind of in-group or out-group, psychologists would call it. Okay, so not you and us, it's just us. Okay, so that'd be the first thing. The second thing is there seems to be much more transparency. For example, when um, the officials in rugby will go to the uh, the, TM, uh, the TMO, sorry, yeah, that is that what it's called in rugby? I think it is. Yeah, I'm not too much for a rugby fan, but I think I'm right. Um, they will then say the word, thank you, I've got the thumbs up. So yeah, the, the wording they use is really specific. So they'll say, is there any reason why I can't do this? Now, what's important there is one, the referee has made that decision. Okay, so the referee is saying, I want to award a try or not award a try. And then the wording is, is there any reason why I cannot? So they're not saying like, tell me what I should do. That has massive impacts on how a referee sells the decision because it enables the referee to be in control of that outcome. And that's something that football referees with VAR don't have at the moment, particularly in the Premier League. Okay. A third possible explanation to this is that the referees in rugby are mic'd up. And so we know that player behavior is modified. So the early reports that we're getting back from professional referees at the moment is that player behavior at playing behind closed doors is a lot better. And the language they're using is a lot better. And the reason is, is because they've been told these microphones pick up everything and there's no crowd noise to block you out. So you're, you're a little bit more um, accountable for your behavior and the language you use. The final thing I'd say, Joe, and this is a really cynical answer to your question, is sports people cheat. OK, cyclists takes drugs, uh, you know, um, bo boxers will, you know, uh, lie on weights or, you know, to kind of try to skip weight somehow um, in order to gain an advantage or lie about the stats of their reach, things like this. Um, we know that baseball players will tell you they caught a ball when it actually got grounded first. OK, we know uh, cricket players will tamper with the ball. So we know that in all sports, people will try to find a way to circumnavigate the rules somehow to their advantage. The rules are the obstacles, right? Coming from a coaching background, by the way, I've actually had coaches you know, at quite high levels of some football clubs actually say our job is to try to bend the rules as much as possible without breaking them. OK, so coaches go in with that attitude. In rugby, because the referee's decision on discipline is so upheld, I don't think it's worthwhile a rugby player trying to argue too much with the referees. They do argue, by the way, and referees uh, in rugby league and rugby union both report high levels of abuse, OK? Um, and, you know, there's been cited in research, just not to the extent that it happens in football. What rugby players do is they might cheat in different ways. So we know that drug taking, for example, is really high, whereas football doesn't really have a drug taking problem. It seems to be socially and historically accepted that in football, the way you cheat is to try to influence the referee. One wonderful study that came out was about players and what type of referees a player like. And the player said, oh, we like referees that you can talk to, that will talk to us. When you first, when you read the first half of that article, you think, oh, that's really good. That's nice communication. And then when it got asked the question, why do you like referees they can talk to? The answer, because you can manipulate them. You can get them on side. They'll give you better decisions. Um, thank you, Sean. Uh, Stuart, I think that uh, we'll, we'll have to conclude there because uh, people are dropping off and now having to go. Yeah. But, uh, no, I really <laughs> appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, I really enjoyed talking to everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, ev every success with the book. And uh, I'll uh, certainly be uh, passing on uh, details of the book to, to, to the members to, to get them to... Uh, to uh, definitely to uh, make that purchase if it's in stock. Uh, no, yeah, if it's in stock, it does seem to go pretty quick. Yeah, but I was always like re, uh, re refilling their uh, digital shelves, so to speak. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye now.